joining us today is the author of this book, a very special guest indeed, because he has worn many hats. And uh, today he joins us as a historian and author, Dr. TCA Raghavan, who is also, of course, India's High Commissioner to Pakistan. And what is amazing, which really blows your mind, is that this book came soon after that he hung up his boots in the foreign service and uh, he came up with this uh, book that completely wowed everybody and it has become a bit of a classic so dr raghavan such a pleasure to have you with us today many thanks for joining us thank you very much for inviting me dr raghavan let me start with the most obvious question where did you find the time to do something like this and when did this idea uh, you know uh, uh, come into your uh, mind uh, that you should be looking at these two uh, very, very interesting nobles, because uh, as our introduction said, they were soldiers, generals, and poets, and really men of their times once there. Well, I got interested in uh, Rahim or Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan a very long time uh, ago, and uh, I grew up in Delhi, so I remember visiting his uh, tomb as a while still in school. And then by chance, uh, we happened also to be studying, perhaps a few months later, uh, some of his Dohas, as we all do in uh, the primary and secondary sections when you're studying Hindi. And I, I, I remember thinking even then, hang on, this is interesting because I uh, just went to this uh, person's tomb. Uh, and the Dohas seemed to animate uh, the tomb. And the idea stayed with me in a vague and desultory uh, kind of way, but uh, it did stay with me. And I started uh, trying to read up more about Abdul Rahim Khane Khana. Mm. Uh, from the 1980s, I realized that there were many layers to his uh, personality. And I uh, started collecting material and talking to people uh, about him, but it was always a vague kind of uh, interest. It was never really clear what is going to come out of it till around 2000 when I felt, by then I had realized to really go into the details of Rahim. You also need to bring in his uh, father and a wider context and give a wider context to the times they lived in. I think around 2000, the idea of a book uh, uh, came to my mind uh, and I started then uh, both putting the material together and also looking and thinking about it much more seriously. It's always possible to find time because you're uh, at the end of the day, it's good to have an interest which is unrelated to your uh, main uh, uh, preoccupation and uh, the subsidiary interest, some people call it a hobby, uh, is very, very, it's a good sidearm to have. It's a kind of second string to your, to your bow. How has your uh, lens over time changed when you were looking at this period or at these two gentlemen? Because I'm sure what started you on this journey would have taken many turns and twists as you, you know, progress in your own career as a diplomat. Uh, and your, uh, your stint in uh, Pakistan would have been very helpful, you were telling me, because you also did a lot of research over there around this. Well, the fact that this project was with me for a long period of time, uh, it enabled me to reflect uh, a lot on uh, the questions I should ask uh, of, the, of the material and my own exposure to different, uh, 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 you know, to different uh, situations certainly enabled me to frame those questions. So my time in Pakistan mm. uh, was very, very useful in trying to raise, uh, to understand uh, the Mughal court from different points of view. Uh, during my career in the foreign service, a major geopolitical change uh, occurred, uh, which was the breakup of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And with the emergence of Central Asian, of the Central Asian uh, region as a number of states, uh, different countries in their own right, suddenly Central Asia became much more proximate to us. Because otherwise we used to only relate to this wider and more distant entity called the Soviet Union. But now you had Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, and I happened to visit there a number of times through the 1990s. And you realize that these are spaces very, very proximate to us. And mm -hmm. that enabled me to really look at uh, Behram Khan uh, 
uh, in a different uh, light rather than just his career uh, in India. You realize that he carried with him a huge baggage. Uh, you know, when he when he came from uh, uh, with Babur from Afghanistan to India. So that Central Asiatic dimension was something which certainly my own uh, principal preoccupation then uh, had a great deal to do about. Similarly, in Pakistan, it enabled me to ask questions about uh, how uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khana, or for that matter, Baram Khan, would have approached uh, uh, issues uh, pertaining to religious divides. Uh, because certainly, as an Indian living in Pakistan, you become much more conscious uh, about uh, Hindu-Muslim issues than you would be uh, otherwise. And you 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 tend to examine uh, something which we give a lot of take a lot of pride in our syncretic tradition much more closely uh, and ask uh, different questions about that tradition. We will come to that. Let us start off with these two gentlemen. Baram Khan, for instance, uh, comes into his own, and, and you uh, 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 do confess in the book that the early part of his story is uh, is you know not really available in terms of you know, the, the exact nature of where he, uh, I mean, how he spent the first uh, decade, decade and a half of his life. But what is interesting is you were telling me that there was a little bit of a rediscovery of Behram Khan, even in Turkmenistan, where they kind of um, put up a statue of him and, you know, uh, decided to own him and embrace him, which uh, you, you, you found interesting. But tell me uh, the antecedents of this man, because he comes into his own when he's, a, I think, in his late 30s, 40s, uh, with the Battle of Kanoj. Uh, and then he plays a very pivotal role because when Humayun is down and out, he acts as a catalyst uh, to introduce Humayun in the Persian court. And that 15 months uh, with the support of the Persian uh, 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 Shah becomes very important in the reclaiming of, of Delhi and the north of India for Humayun. So let's start the story of Behram Khan from there for all those who didn't quite get to read the book and I'm sure will be picking up the book after this session. Well, Behram Khan's life and career really is a uh, illustration of uh, what I said, which is about uh, the proximity of Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, to us because uh, six, 700 years ago, people were traveling these distances quite effortlessly. Uh, and after having lived for uh, the most part of their lives uh, in, uh, in Persia or in uh, parts of Central Asia or in Afghanistan, would then move to Delhi or even deeper into peninsular India. And these transitions were taking place uh, all the time. And Behram Khan, I think, represents that uh, kind of person who, who lives in, who comes from a very well-known family uh, of uh, Central Asia. And, uh, and the roots of that family and the politics of that family has a lot to do with uh, the history of uh, uh, Turkic Central Asia from about the 12th, 13th century uh, onwards. The, there are clashes with the Mughals and finally their accommodation with the Mughals. Uh, so uh, it, it's a separate history uh, and uh, uh, in its own right. And Behram Khan's ancestors themselves were known to be poets, and many of them have left uh, collections of poetry that are still uh, studied today. But Behram Khan, finally, his father, the grandfather, was forced out because that family was losing out, and they made their way to Afghanistan and finally joined up with uh, as courtiers or as soldiers, as adventurers, as mercenaries uh, in Babur's court. And Babur, meanwhile, had been forced out of Samarkand uh, by the Uzbeks and was in Afghanistan looking for space in which he could establish his own kingdom. And that is how they, they tra traveled to, uh, to India. Badam is not a well-known uh, person at that time. But really, as you said, it is uh, sometime in Humayu's reign when Humayu is, uh, and Humayu in many ways in the early parts of his career as emperor is a loser. I mean, he can't get things uh, right. And one by one, he's deserted by his principal nobles. His brothers turn against him. And at that stage, Behram emerges as a figure of strength, mm -hmm. uh, as a confidant, as an advisor, and as someone who tells him, and this is when Humayu really has no future left in India. His brothers have turned against him. He has been decisively uh, 
defeated on the battlefield by by Sher Shah. There is an there is an Afghan uh, resurrection in India, which is forcing the Mughals out. And at Bairam's advice, he goes to Persia because Bairam tells him that I know that space. I have still uh, kinsmen uh, or my kin folk are important over there. We'll be able to raise an army and come back and reclaim your kingdom. And the chronology really plays out very much as part of this uh, script that mm. he goes to Persia, manages to convince with some heavy lifting because he has to convince the, the Safed court that he's also a very good Shia, which he was not, but he raises an army, first comes, defeats one brother in Kabul, uh, establishes a kingdom in Kabul, and then comes down to Delhi, defeats uh, the Afghans, and re-establishes uh, his kingdom. And Bairam is a pivotal person in this whole uh, process. He really comes into his own then. And when Himayu dies prematurely, uh, it's uh, not a surprise that Bairam, uh, Akbar is still a very young boy. So Bairam is the regent of the empire, uh, of, the, uh, of the young emperor. Uh, you know what, what I found interesting was in this early period, the 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 very uh, troubled relations with the Shah of Iraq, the, the Safavid uh, ruler, and Humayun, the numerous insults, the you know it was like you said, Humayun was down and out, and I think uh, and that's perhaps where Bairam comes into his own because he handles the situation for him. But you know, if, from the later part of the Mughals, you can't even anticipate how badly off they were before they uh, before Humayun comes back, actually. Well, when he finally crosses Sindh and goes into Persia, Humayun, some records say, had not more than 30 or 40 followers with him. So he was, uh, for all practical purposes, a nobody. Mm. Uh, but uh, he manages to, uh, you know, convince uh, the Safid Shah that he is a useful bet, uh, and because and he will be able to give uh, give to them something which they've always wanted, which is control of Kandahar, and Kandahar remained for the next two hundred and fifty years uh, a bone of contention between the Safids and the Mughals, uh, and at that time it was uh, 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 really in the control of one of Humayun's brothers. So Humayu, with the help of a Persian army defeats this brother and says, I will hand back Kandahar uh, to you, which he in the end does not do. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the Persians uh, quite early on realized the duplicitous nature of the Mughals in their foreign policy uh, dealings, <laughs> uh, so to say. But it is interesting as a, uh, when you think about uh, Humayun's time in Persia, the personal uh, humiliation for him as someone who was once a king uh, having to be really a supplicant in a foreign court. Uh, and I think Bairam played an immensely useful role uh, by possibly telling him that, you know, overlook the slides and look at the larger strategic picture. Because what we need out of here uh, is an army with which we can go to Afghanistan and begin the process of reclaiming your kingdom. Mm. But Bairam, as you, as you pointed out, comes uh, into the limelight as a regent of Akbar. And I would like to uh, draw uh, our, our viewers' attention to the cover of uh, The Attendant Lords, which has a lovely portrait of miniature of uh, Akbar uh, uh, training with a gun. And uh, you have Bairam, uh, who's standing right behind him uh, and has, uh, you know, you can see him with his tunic. Uh, right behind Akbar uh, and, and a man of authority because he's a central figure in that uh, portrait. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, and telling uh, picture because he, at this point, also becomes this conniving control freak, doesn't he? But he <laughs> very quickly, uh, you know, does away with the, 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 the nobles on the other side because there is a sectarian angle to this also because Bairam is a Shia, the court is largely Sunni. So uh, he manages this period with a lot of uh, brutal decisiveness, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I think the Mughal court, like all courts, was a real cockpit of intrigue and factions uh, hmm. and all kinds of rivalries. Uh, Shia Sunni was one of them, but there were other ethnic rivalries. There were different tribes uh, 
because, uh, uh, and there were different, uh, you had, uh, within the Sunnis, there were different uh, tribes, there were Persians, there were Central Asians, there were Turkic, uh, and so on. So how to, to, to carve out a space for yourself while retaining your authority uh, over the young uh, emperor, this was the question which Behram uh, confronted. Uh, Akbar had his own, there, there, was a, there, were, there was a group of nobles very close to him, uh, really part of uh, an extension of the harem of Akbar's uh, aunts, his mother, his wet nurses, their husbands. So, so the whole, it, it was an ecosystem of intrigue and uh, factionalism. Uh, and the regent had to make sure that his authority is not questioned, which obviously meant that you have to be ruthless and where necessary, make a real example of those who could be potential uh, uh, sources of opposition. Uh, and he really rides quite roughshod over a number of them, including nobles who had been very important in Humayu's reign, uh, but he has them executed, he has them imprisoned, um, uh, and so on. But the idea was to establish the writ of the regent uh, because this was still a fledging uh, state. I mean, they had, they had no idea where they were going to be. The, the Mughals had recently uh, come back. Uh, there was an Afghan uh, uprising, uh, possibly in the offing. So re-establishing the writ of the emperor, uh, and that meant re-establishing the writ of the regent was very important. Uh, and while in retrospect, we can say that uh, Baram made the mistake, which all men in power do, that they identify uh, the larger cause with them. But I think in the Mughal court, probably at that time, it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it was perhaps in the natural order of things that finally opposition to him would grow. Uh, and that... Uh, Opposition will also coincide with the emperor growing up and coming of age and not wanting this uh, man uh, whom he relied on and who was greatly respected, but he didn't want this figure towering over and overseeing every decision he wanted to take. 